Good afternoon to everybody. Good morning to those of you still on the on the West Coast. Uh, but welcome to our webinar focused on the future of access control. This is part one in what will be two part uh, webinar session. Uh, the second part will be coming up here in the coming weeks. But uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we do have a lot of great content um, set up for you over the next hour. Uh, and, and we'll also have some room for questions and answers as we get into the, the back half of the session. Uh, Devin, if you want to go ahead and move on to the next slide. So before we jump in, just a little bit of background relative to the Secure Technology Alliance. Uh, I know a number of you are probably familiar with the organization, uh, but it did start over 20 years ago at this stage, uh, initially with a focus around perpetuating smart card use here uh, in the U.S. Since that time, as it really has morphed into a broader remit relative to what we like to call secure identity uh, and you've got a focus if you can see there on the left with the graphic uh, we're focused uh, on three industries at this stage uh, the payments industry the access control industry and then also broader forms of identity management as we move forward uh, obviously there, there is some overlap uh, between each of those those industries and that's where we believe that we have our strength um, the structures underpinned really kind of behind three pillars uh, that we focus on facilitating. So it includes collaboration, <clears throat> education on new technologies and best practices, uh, as well as providing a forum for uh, industry players, both companies and individuals to network as well, right? So, um, you know, that, that's a, a broad overview of kind of what we're stru structured like. You can see our vision and mission there. I, I won't read it off to you. Um, but something that will continue to evolve over time as we continue to to take feedback from members and also make sure that we're positioned for growth in, in, a, in a pretty dynamic space, which is the technology industry. Is the next slide, please, Devin. Right, so the, the, this particular effort and webinar uh, has been a, a work in progress now for, for several months. It has taken the efforts of a number of different individuals uh, to help put together this content. Uh, we wanted to call out specific contributors, uh, although they won't be sitting and participating uh, as panelists today. We did want to call out a few individuals uh, and their efforts in pulling together the materials. So special thank you to Jerry Smith, David Farolo, Colin Doniger, Steve Rogers, John Jacob, and Bill Windsor. Thank you all for, for your contributions uh, in helping us pull together this content this afternoon. Uh, next slide, please. And with that is, is I'll give you a quick introduction relative to our three panelists. Uh, first up is we have Mark Dale. Is uh, Mark is the senior systems engineer for mobility at X Tech. Uh, you can see his background. He's been in the industry for for quite a while. Uh, background includes design development and application of smart card biometric derived credentials and mobile solutions. So a broad remit uh, focus at this point is on alignment of solutions for commercial, federal, state, and local identity, credentials and access management requirements across multiple vertical markets. Uh, Mark has been actively engaged in the HSPD-12 rollout uh, really since its inception back in 2004 and continues to remain engaged um, with program management offices at DHS Treasury uh, DOL uh, and in Virginia. So special welcome to Mark. Thank you for joining. Uh, next up, if we want to move on to the next slide, is we have Roger Rohr. Roger is the Director of Identity Management for Integrated Security Technologies, or IST for short. Uh, he is the lead architect uh, for the Pentagon Force Protection Agency, uh, including their efforts around the Identity Credential Access Management System. Uh, he has participated over his career in the delivery of the GSA FIPS 201 shared service solution, uh, helped create and really led the creation of the GSA approved vendor list, uh, and was an active participant uh, in the TWIC card program. Uh, previously at chair of the STA's Access Control Council and a board member of the former Smart Card Alliance, which is now the Secure Technology Alliance. And you can see a few hits certifications there at the bottom. Special welcome to Roger. Thank you for joining us. And then lastly is we have uh, on the next slide, we have Lars Sonneborn. Uh, so Lars is the senior consultant for ID Technology Partners. 
Uh, as you can see, Lars has been in the industry for several decades at this point, uh, a 40 year career that spans multiple organizations, uh, which has also kind of identified him as a subject matter expert when it comes to physical access control and high, high assurance identity credentialing. Um, he's led a variety of US, Canadian and British security agencies PACS deployments at high risk facilities. Uh, he is a two term chair of the Access Control Council uh, for the Alliance, both from the, the 07 to 2012 timeframe, as well as uh, 2019 up through today. So special welcome to Lars. He is also uh, the leader for our CSEIP certification program which we manage as, as part of the Alliance and is actively promoting smart card biometric and PKI cryptographic technologies as vital components with the, within the overall uh, system. So special welcome to Lars. Thank you for joining as well. And with that, as we'll go ahead and, and move on to the next slide, and I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mark Dale to kick things off. All right, so we're going to be talking about uh, in this session uh, trending authentication and uh, credentials and devices. Uh, and as we move into this, so the topics uh, they're going to discuss here is first off uh, security and pr privacy considerations for trending credentials. Uh, we'll talk about mobile devices that will be leveraged for both mobile IDs for both logical and physical access control mobile IDs and biometrics, uh, which will expand into new use cases in the future. As touch on current and new credential types that will be employed across uh, horizontal and vertical markets. And then a, a little bit on biometrics and uh, the biometrics that are supported by mobile devices. So security and privacy first. Uh, you know, technology is a beast that needs to be tamed. Uh, it, it needs to be tamed within the context of a governance model uh, in, within the trust frameworks. So, here's the standard uh, trust model framework. Uh, you got issuers, you got users, and you got relying parties. So, some of the credentials and things that we're going to be talking about uh, uh, is going to be looking at some credentials that could contain uh, personally identifiable information, PII. And so this privacy is a big aspect of it, but also uh, the security and security needs to be built into any issuance, any initiatives re, uh, re, yeah, related to uh, you know, the applications of technology. So we'll just keep this in mind as we move forward, but I just wanted to touch on the aspect that if you know security is not built into the implementations that they get go, uh, you're doomed for failure. And if privacy is not under consideration, you're doomed for uh, critical attacks uh, by ACLU's uh, other uh, organizations that want to ensure that uh, an individual's privacy and privacy information uh, is maintained and controlled uh, within a, a decent governance model or a critical governance model. So with that aside, what we're looking at is traditional or legacy credentials. And as we all seen, smart cards, RFID tags, flash passes, and even driver's license are used as a, as a credential. And then of course, username and password. And a lot of the things that have gone into uh, the credentialing access control space, you know, over the past how many years is, you know, trying to either get rid of username and password or augment username and password with some other form of authentication. So, but we're going to look at the uh, smart cards. You know, smart cards are the uh, probably the most technically advanced uh, uh, token credential uh, within the legacy. Uh, and traditional credentials, but smart cards, as we all know, are used all over the place, you know, payments, credit cards, banking, government IDs, universities, uh, everything else. Uh, mobile devices are in infringing or encroaching on uh, smart card markets. Uh, and so payments and credit cards and banking cards, uh, you know, certainly you can carry around a your credit card, smart card in your wallet, but then you can also, if you want to use a mobile device for doing payments. Uh, 
and government IDs, uh, you know, smart cards are certainly there, PIV cards, uh, but then government uh, is also uh, engaged in uh, doing mobile credentials with derived credentials and looking at other credentials in the futures. And so the, the whole list goes on, but uh, mobile devices and mobile credentials are getting a, a part of being a part of not necessarily taking over smart cards, but uh, being able to use mobile devices in similar type of uh, transactions and for specific uh, use cases generally. And when we're talking about mobile devices, you know, this conglomerate of smart cards, tablets, wearables, uh, they have a value proposition. I'm going to delve into something that's a little bit more, but they are existing the devices that can be used as a credential. Uh, you can store multiple credentials on a single device. Uh, the credentials that go on the device can be provisioned remotely and updated remotely. And these devices provide, you know, a slew of security features comparable to smart cards, and they support multi-factor authentication. Uh, they're convenient, accessible, and expedient. And then we're going to look a little bit more on what are the features of these particular type of devices. These devices are feature-rich, uh, you know, all of them. Just like a smart card, you know, they have the general components of a, of a processing, you know, computer, uh, everything else. They have security modules. I uh, won't go into detail on all of these. Um, they provide a wide range of communications external to the device. And then what makes them kind of attractive in a lot of areas is uh, they have uh, different types of sensors that can be leveraged for, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, access control uh, transactions. And here's just a little bit on, you know, the communications capabilities, near field communications, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular. Uh, uh, they have a camera, they have a display. Uh, and so for local authentication, NFC, Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth low energy, a uh, combination of those, it could be used for physical access. For remote access, you can uh, scan a QR code on a computer screen, and then that does a connection rollover to some server somewhere for doing authentication and sharing a credential. Same thing with an uh, NFC tag. And then there's face-to-face -face attendant authentication. You can do a flash pass. You can present a barcode to a camera and then start an authentication there. And then also, it's the more interesting one, at least for me, is uh, the device device communications that could go between phones or between a phone or an IoT device or another uh, other devices as well. And the other aspect of these, as I talked about earlier, as far as the feature richness of it, uh, mobile devices contain a slew of uh, uh, capabilities for biometric modalities, face, fingerprint, voice. Iris, uh, and then wearables also add on to that. You can do heart rate monitoring and blood pressure monitoring. And looking at those in the context of uh, multi-factor authentication, you know, it's standard uh, traditional model, something you have, something you know, something you know are, are you know, across single factor, uh, two factor and three factor. Uh, just keep in mind in this, and then we'll go and see what we can do where mobile devices can expand on that <laughs> on the on top of uh, you know something you know something you are and something you have you know with the GPS and proximity sensors uh, in mobile devices you can do a somewhere you are that could help uh, confirm a presence you know at an authentication reader or some way of tracking you through uh, a wayfaring application you know to see that you have been through a process on that uh, Getting a look more exotic, you know, behavioral authentication has been around for a while, uh, but you know it's something you do. They got you know gestures, gyro, accelerometers, anything that can sit there and gather information on your behavioral authentication. And then there's physiological authentication, is how you are, and in particular reference to uh, the wearables and the heart rate, blood pressure, and, and other sensors like that that might be used in specific use cases where. Uh, you want to have a uh, physiological profile that you've tracked, you know, through 
uh, you know, in the past or remove that profile into the future for something a little bit more exotic. Certainly, uh, behavioral and physiological authentication get more into the PII stuff, but in a controlled security and privacy uh, trust framework, there are use cases where these can be applied. So, trending credentials. Uh, so, when we looked at, you know, in two areas, uh, we have credentials and vertical markets that are specific to a, a, a certain vertical market, the government uh, PIV credentials, uh, uh, CAC, TWIC, and derived credentials are good examples of those. They're, they are issued and maintained within the federal governance uh, trust framework. Uh, and even the relying parties are within that framework. And then similarly, corporate IDs, uh, you know, for specific companies or a group of companies or whatever, uh, those are associated with vertical markets. Uh, the training credentials that we're going to be talking about are the ones that can go horizontal and be uh, applied across markets, uh, be issued in one place, but you know, it would be used for a slew of uh, relying parties that you know, weren't even considered. And then we're going to specifically talk about uh, FIDO verifiable credentials and mobile driver's licenses at, at a high level here, uh, just to give it a sampling of what, uh, you know, uh, trending, yeah, trending credentials are. Yeah. So FIDO, FIDO was created to uh, get rid of, or at least go around uh, the cost that associated associated with uh, the PKI infrastructure, uh, uh, basically, you know, a mobile device or a laptop, or whatever. If you want to set up an association with a relying party, uh, your device generates uh, an RSC key pair, keeps a private key, presents and sends over the public keys to the relying party. That's part of the registration process. And that public key acts as both an identifier, but then it's also used for authentication for by the relying party. Or the relying party, when uh, an access control transaction takes place, can encrypt a challenge, send it to your device, your private keys is the only key they can decrypt that, and that sends back the challenge in the clear, and that helps authenticate uh, uh, on, the, on the transaction. And, with FIDO, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, you know, so, you know, you're not doing something that's been centralized somewhere. Uh, if you want to make a registration association specifically with one relying party, and then you do one with another relying party, you generate a key pairs, and then you create your own identity for each one of those. So that's basically what FIDO is all about, and it's widely deployed. Maybe uh, you might not even be using it if you're using multi-factor authentication with your phone, but FIDO's been around and will be in the future. Uh, verifiable credentials, uh, they're gaining ground. It's basically um, an issuer provides or provisions a, uh, a credential uh, to a user, uh, but then also puts the user information with identifiers and potentially attributes containing anything, roles, uh, certifications, whatever, in a example, a blockchain ledger. Uh, and then during a uh, relying party transaction or access transaction, uh, the relying party uh, can verify that credential uh, against the, the blockchain ledger. So I won't go into detail on it, but just say this is gaining ground and it's moving forward. And mobile driver's licenses is of, you know, certainly particular interest in, in a lot of areas right now. Yeah, it's very trendy. Um, so mobile driver's licenses are based on an international ISO standard 18013-5. And as states start to issue in the next two to three, four years, uh, everybody will end up having uh, a mobile driver's license or the option to have a mobile driver's license. But once you have a mobile driver's license on your phone, it can be used across uh, oh, many uh, horizontal and vertical markets for doing verification. And the other thing with uh, ISO 18013-5, that standard has become attractive for 
uh, to a lot of uh, uh, in government agencies as well as uh, outside the government for using that standard, not for mobile driver's license, but as a standard since it's international, it defines an extendable uh, attribute set. You can create namespaces and add attributes to that for whatever type of uh, credential that you want to create. And then the standard also defines a, a slew of interfaces, and that's what makes it attractive too, that it's international standard. And then they have interoperable interfaces, like the ones that I showed in the previous slide related to the physical access control, logical access control, and, and attended uh, 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 access control uh, scenarios. And um, John Jacob is with Idemia is going to go into details uh, on these credentials and a few other things in the next webinar series, so stay tuned for that. So, in summation, what we're looking at is the future uh, access control key points, you know, again, devices with the rich feature sets, uh, wearables, uh, smartphones, uh, uh, tablets uh, will be employed in those uh, technologies and those features will be uh, exploited or can be exploited. The credentials, we just talked about current ones, emerging, emerging ones, and certain of there'll be ones in the future. Uh, maybe way down 10 to 20 years down the road when we get into the post-quantum uh, era, you know, uh, there is going to be, uh, you know, certainly a, a revamp and a revolution in what uh, uh, credentials are, are going to look like. But in between time, who knows, there may be something uh, exotic or even uh, more attractive than the ones we've just mentioned. You know, biometrics will be employed in a variety of targeted use cases. Uh, and they can be used in uh, low assurance, low risk situations, just as a single factor. Uh, and then again, talking about you know the mobile devices and our capabilities is expanding authentication factors beyond something you have and something you are. And there's some references here uh, that you can t do a takeaway on. But uh, with that, I thank you, and then I'll pass this. Uh, on to Roger Rohr with Integrated Secure Technologies, uh, talking about the uh, uh, interesting biometrics. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so when we look at biometrics, it, I think a lot of times they kind of been misidentified. You know, if we look at identity factors, uh, biometrics are a great non-repudiation tool, but they're not actually such a great unique ID tool. Um, which a lot of people don't really realize. Uh, if you look at something like a hand geometry, it's really about the equivalent of entropy, about a four digit pin. Uh, you know, fingerprints, we talk about a 125,000 being a really good match. So that's like a six digit pin. You get better with iris and faces getting really good. But they're certainly not as unique, even in many ways as like a 26 digit. Uh, prox card or 26 bit prox card and you know don't come clear clearly don't come as unique as you know what we have in the PIV data models uh, so what they are is they are really good non repudiation tools you can't pass your uh, biometric off to your secretary to have them digitally sign for you you can't like you could would say with a PIV with a pin number um, so they have I think they're not the same type of factor as the other factors. The other factors we look at are basically yes, no questions. And biometrics are not absolute. You know, biometrics are a risk measurement. You say, hey, I'm willing to accept this much risk to authenticate somebody that they really belong here. Uh, as you get to accepting less and less risk, you're gonna get more rejects and that's what usually kills biometric programs is they become so hard to use that nobody can use them um, that you know this thing doesn't work and you know what do you do when the thing doesn't work and you know a lot of times i've heard some people say like oh let's have a bio pen well a pin is just about the opposite of a biometric you know pins just a, a unique identifier but it's virtually no um it's no non-repudiation can be easily passed around and can be copied multiple times. 
Uh, so when we get to biometric matching, you really got two things and you should options. You really need to look at what you're doing um, and that drives the, and the risk too. So there's identification where you just basically are matching the person against the gallery. We call the person you're matching a probe. Uh, so which your probe is going against this gallery. Uh, as your gallery grows, your risk grows. You know, you got much better chance of faults except if you got a much bigger gallery. Um, and when IEEE ran a certification program, they actually said what you got was a candidate pool. They didn't even say you had a match. They just said, hey, you have a candidate pool. Now we certainly see devices deployed that they say, okay, whoever, if you match, you know, you come out above this certain score with one of the candidates in the pool, we'll let you through. But, you know, it is risk. Verification. This is usually indexed off of a pin or a card read. And that way, you know that that person, you're just matching that one biometric against that one, one reference against the one probe. And that, as the gallery grows, the risk stays the same. You know, you just have that one in 25,000 that that person will match that credential. So let's look at some interesting use cases going forward. Uh, I'll just take this, this is your standard average Joe going to work. He gets up in the morning, he gets his smartphone, he does a fingerprint authentication biometric to open up the phone, read his emails, jumps in his car, and then he drives to work. And this is something that we all do pretty much every day. And we go in the office and this time he uses his phone to authenticate to go in the office. Well, when I started looking at this, we have a lot of information. One, something he has is his phone. Um, that's something that he was bound to by the phone company, and we know that. Uh, he does his fingerprint, so we now have a non repudiation that he's truly in possession of his phone. Uh, he was connected to his home Wi Fi, so we, we go, okay, this is a routine pattern that, you know, this phone was where we expect to be, so it was connected to his home Wi Fi. We know the time between the car and walking between his car and his house. Um, probably don't have enough information, probably not, not far enough walk to get a real good gate biometric. We'll talk about that. He Bluetooths to his car, so he uses the same car to come to work every day. And, you know, one of the things I didn't even think about, we could even do, a, say, an OCR on his plate as he comes through the gate, so we know he's got the same license plate, at least on the car. Um, but I didn't put that in the list, I just thought of that now. Uses Waze navigation. Um, so he's logging into that application and, you know, he routinely does that. He maybe flags stuff. It doesn't. But, you know, we just kind of have a habit. Uh, we do get a gate bar, Mark, Rick, Rick, because he has to walk a little more distance probably in the parking lot from his car into the office. And then we also know that probably because these other things have happened, that he's been in possession of this phone since it left his house this morning. Um, he arrives during normal working hours. We kind of know that, he, you know, if he's a day shift guy, he should arrive during the day, if he's a night shift guy. So if he shows up after hours, maybe we decide we need more authentications. We need him to enter his pin. We need something like that. Uh, he connects to the work Wi-Fi. So usually there's some sort of authentication that you got to do to connect to that work file. You've, you've connected before, we've seen his phone. He's like, yeah, he's legitimately connected to the work Wi-Fi while he walks in. And the last one we could even have is what Mark's talking about is wearables. You know, his heartbeat has been constant since this morning with his watch connected to his phone. So heartbeat could be another biometric. So we're looking at just to what would be somebody's normal day here, over 10 factors that go to say, hey, this person is really this person who's in been in charge of this token over the whole time. Um, it starts to 
be a very powerful authentication. I mean, and some of them all stand alone are pretty good, like the phone and the fingerprint. Home Wi-Fi may not be so good, especially if he doesn't put a strong password on or doesn't put any password on. You know, walking to his car is not that good. But the combination of these 10 really makes for a very, very strong, and we have single... Uh, matching biometrics and we're just basically doing that all to the phone and then he's controlling that privacy issue next one we could say is showing up for a control uh in the gallery for at an airport say this person's going to take a flight today now they actually decide you know you know what airport they're going to do so you reduce that you know what airline they're going to do, so you reduce your gallery pretty significantly. Then you know what flight they're going to be on or what time that that flight is supposed to depart. We can keep reducing this gallery very, very significantly. And then we you know, probably could even reduce it to a flight. And we're looking at one in 300 people with a one in 25,000, you know, matching. Hey, we got a lot better chance that we really do have the right person versus it say, hey, you're looking at a gallery of all the people that are known to fly or all the people that are going to fly today. And so that's a way we can control the gallery to make your biometric authentications if you're just solely relying on a biometric authentication more reliable. Okay, and with that, I will um, go ahead and pass the torch over to Lars. So what we're going to talk about here is uh, some some integration that are being made possible by the increased power that we have in computers today. In 1970, the founder of Intel Corporation stated that the processing power will will double every two years. And that statement has certainly proven true for decades. And that statement applies both to PCs as well as to mobile devices, which indeed are very compact and portable, powerful computers. And with the wide acceptance of mobile devices like we've seen here today, these are, this will see a growing use in access control. And this section is just to illustrate some potential future development in the world of access control that is made possible due to the increased processing power. We're seeing both cor corporations and federal agencies move away from the old model where an employee had a permanent office assigned. Instead, the new model is kind of a, of a flex model. And that means then that the employees will very likely be assigned or reserve a different office every day. And that will be a different location in the same organization. Not only office spaces can be reserved like this, it is also meeting rooms and often the mobile device is used to uh, to um, reserve these these offices and these spaces so once we get to the point here where we have rooms and meeting rooms and other spaces uh, reserved with a mobile device uh, invited invited people will have a hard time finding where this is so we are we are having a development that we're seeing here today that is beginning to be more and more popular of so-called wayfinders. And it doesn't matter if this office space is located in a single building or in a complex campus type environment with multiple buildings. Mobile, phones are mobile phone devices and applications are developed to show the way to the assigned space in the correct building and as well as to other, other points of interest along the way. Wayfinder applications are beginning to, to map out the shortest walk path and other points of interest along the way. And what we can see here is an, a typical example of somebody arriving into to a campus, and this is where we are, and this is where we need to go. Medical centers, universities, hospitals, they are other examples of very large facilities where visitors often need some kind of assistance in finding a specific room or other area. So these, these Wayfinders apps are now beginning to, to be offered by a few developers and future and feature sets will certainly expand and become more and more, more and more advanced as time goes on. But what if there could be more integration with local, local systems to enable pro provisioning so that a Wayfinder can be integrated with other platforms and other subsystems? 
what we're seeing here in the industry today and have seen for the past couple of years, I would say, is that there are more and more integration, both at the front end as well as the back end, with different platforms and different databases are merged. So what if the office reservation system could be integrated with a Wayfinder? And what if that Wayfinder was integrated with a physical access control system? The host, the host site then could send a credential to the visitor phone. And the visitor phone credential could possibly be provisioned in the packs to a relevant access control point. So let's see what that might, what might, might look like in a future application here. Let's say here that we have Bob who works in a field office of a corporation back in say Minneapolis. And he comes to visit the corporate headquarters in Washington DC for, for let's say for five days. And when Bob arrives, he has used his room reservation system to select or be assigned his temporary workspace. Let's say that he has got the room that is called some obscure name like D0512EF. And uh, where is that? Where could that possibly be? Well, the Wayfinder would know the location of that. So what if the Wayfinder can then be integrated with a local access control system? And the access control system would then know the access control points along the way, the path that Bob needs to talk, that Bob needs to walk. And what then, if we have seen here in the previous presentation, if we could have then uh, the mobile device registered to the access control system as per company policy, and the gen and just like in a hotel key application, a credential could be generated and sent down to the mobile device and then be provisioned in the access control system so that, that the, all of a sudden, Bob can use his mobile device at the access control point. And like we have also seen in the previous presentations, mobile devices support, support multi-factor authentication so that local multi-factor authentication can be used at the various access control points. But let's see what this might look like in, in a scenario where Bob arrives. So Bob comes here and he has his mobile device and he has this not being provisioned. Let's say that he is authorized to park in the corporate parking garage. So he shows his mobile device to the parking garage reader and he enters in, drives in there and he parks his car. And the wayfinder will show him the right elevator, the shortest path to the correct elevator. He'll take the elevator up to the, to the lobby floor. And since the access control system and now seeing Bob's phone, it knows that Bob has arrived. So he, he does not need to stop at the visitor registration desk. He just looks at his phone and the phone says, proceed out to the front door and go out to the courtyard and turn left. He walks across the courtyard, comes up to the next building, goes in. He presents his mobile, dev mobile device and use whatever authentication methods that might be required as the corporate policy. He goes in, he goes to the right hallway, and he follows the instructions as per his wayfinder on the mobile device. And here he is at the office that he has, uh, that he has reserved to be assigned for a few days. Should a visit be concluded sooner, then he can just simply be, uh, that's a, that privilege can simply be revoked. So what we have then is mobile devices are universally accepted. And we have increasing processing power and memory capability that enables more integration, both at the front end as well as on the back end. We are seeing rapidly increasing applications for both mobile devices, operate, all operating systems. And we are also, also seeing developers taking advantage of these powerful platforms that the mobile devices offer. And they are way beyond the traditional multi-factor, something you have, something you know, and something you are that we heard in Roger's presentation a few minutes ago. They do offer convenience and expedience. And then of course, whenever we deal with mobile devices and potential biometric in here, there are always privacy laws that may have to, that may be applicable that we have to consider. So well, here, one, ex one example of what we might see in the future. And I think there's some exciting possibilities coming up here. Anyone else that wanna take a shot at what might be possible in the future here? So with that, Thank you, and we're ready to take some some questions. All right, thank you very much, Lars.
Uh, as I'm going to go ahead and come back to Mark as we get some questions relative to credentials. Um, question one is, will smart cards eventually go away and be replaced by mobile devices? <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I don't see smart cards going away soon, of course. Uh, uh, they will be around for quite a long time. If you look at uh, some of the lists that I had up there for where smart cards are used, uh, you know, 34% of the market for smart cards is in banking and uh, payments. Uh, and some people like to use uh, smart cards. And I guess if you want to say a younger generation that grew up with uh, smartphones, uh, uh, they're more likely to use a, uh, a mobile device for, for doing payments. So, uh, it's going to be kind of an overlap for a while, uh, and then we'll just see how it goes. So. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I agreed. I think it's probably going to be somewhat more complementary here for the foreseeable future. Uh, we, we do have a second question relative to the COVID pandemic. Is How has the COVID pandemic affected the use of mobile devices and credentials? Uh, yeah, so certainly the... The pandemic has kind of affected a reorder of uh, the working environment and obviously with uh, remote uh, workers and then with remote workers. Uh, mobile devices, mobile credentials have taken on more of an important role because you know, other than using maybe you know, a PIV card in your your um, laptop, whatever to log in, you know, from your home office uh, into a. Uh, uh, the government resource or whatever or doing whatever you need to do uh, for your your work role. Uh, there are other users who are uh, as remote, but then the mobile devices provide, you can't plug a smart card into your mobile device, but it makes it more convenient with a mobile credential uh, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, certainly access a, a resource from a mobile device. And then also a lot of um, you don't have to have, at least for your laptop or whatever, uh, in different uh, remote scenarios, and uh, you don't have to have the added cost of uh, putting a smart card reader into your device, you know, even though most devices come in with USB uh, ports and stuff like that. There are certain, especially in the, uh, the government space, considerations for the cost of uh, smart card readers uh, deployed you know, outside of uh, uh, the GFE that they provide, you know, and then uh, uh, providing that, uh, you know, to uh, another laptop or another device that's not necessarily GFE. So. Oh, and then the other thing on COVID, I mean, certainly the pandemic has uh, made a kind of a paradigm shift in remote users. And there's, there's probably going to be after COVID is over with whenever it is, that shift that was affected or caused by COVID has uh, blossomed into a new uh, remote uh, worker environment that's going to last beyond COVID. No, very good. Thank you for that. Is it, we are starting to get a few questions into the Q and A box as well. Um, this first one looks like it's for you, Mark, as well. Uh, Tony Lazinski is uh, the first speaker compared. Biometrics to four, six, eight, 128 pens. Um, the ability to automate password attempts. Can you automate biometric attempts as well? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you I'm, can you repeat that again? Yes, it's. I, I think there might be a misspelling in the Q and A box, but um, is it says for the the first speaker compared biometrics to four, six, eight, and 128 pens. Um, it says hack us automate password attempts, which I, I believe is, it looks like you can uh, automate. Passwords. Can you automate biometric attempts as well? I think there's, you know, this is Roger, you know, obviously most biometrics have a liveness detection in them. Um, so, and uh, one of the things I didn't talk about quite often, the other thing that makes biometrics kind of interesting is, uh, you actually throw out 100% matches because you kind of figure that um, you're getting the probe is actually 
be you're getting the reference image maybe refed back to you if you get 100 percent matches so and then that way it's kind of interesting in that you have entropy in the every time you come up to it and that can make it you know you could actually say hey i want another presentation it may only be a 90 percent match but it's a different set of reference you know minutia points is what we have in biometrics so um certainly you know yes the classic thing is hey can you replay the um a reference or maybe you re if you like say pwn the machine and the fingerprint machine is on the computer somebody could you know grab a probe a genuine probe and replay that um you know that goes back to the security of the device and how well that is secured um so you know we're even seeing some stuff where like there's um fingerprint template matchers built into smart cards and the idea is that it's the whole secure device um that is separate from like say the main computer fair enough no thank you roger for jumping in on that one um we've got some additional questions coming in here too as you can see it in the q a uh, box uh from dan de blasio is our all smartphones equally secure um, and Mark or Lars, I would probably direct that to one of you two guys. Yeah, I guess I'll take, <laughs> that's a good question. I'll take that one uh, to the extent that I, uh, I can. Uh, uh, no, they're not necessarily, uh, but you can see there's differences between uh, specifically iOS devices and Android devices. I, there, uh, I maybe I'm going to have to qualify this, but there, there are depending upon the level of security that's required for a particular credential and particular use case. Uh, both platforms, you know, certainly provide uh, key stores and key chains uh, that are managed by the operating system, and those are uh, to a level uh, degree um, uh, software managed. Uh, key stores, key chains, you know, that contain uh, sensitive information uh, that a particular application has control over or applications within the same application group. So you get into further uh, uh, delving into having hardware security modules that will support uh, storing uh, sensitive data, then the platforms are somewhat different. So, uh, iOS is pretty homogeneous uh, in their capabilities and their support with their secure enclave uh, across all their models, you know, since it's a single manufacturer, but with uh, Android, then there are different degrees and different implementations of, you know, uh, se se secure elements in trusted execution environments. So Samsung phones, uh, they have Samsung Knox trusted environments. And then you can use their uh, TEMA based hardware implementations for uh, storing and in information on on those uh, particular devices. And then uh, Google and Android also has a consortium. I can't remember what it's called, but with chip manufacturers, uh, NXP being one of them, uh, of creating a what they call a uh, hardware. Uh, uh, adaptation layer where developers can sit there and not have to sit there and think that we have to sit there and write to an NXP chip or a Samsung Knox chip, but using the same interface from an application perspective, uh, depending upon what uh, uh, Android model you're using, whether it's Motorola or Samsung or Google, uh, they don't have to sit there and write specifically to each of those manufacturers. They can use this uh, hardware adaptation layer uh, once and then with on that device, uh, those particular APIs and calls will do the storage of whatever implementation for the secure elements of the trust and environments uh, on the device are uh, across the different manufacturers. So there's a difference between Android and iOS phones. I wouldn't necessarily say uh, one is better than the other. I'm just saying there's differences, especially in the Android space, about different implementations from a hardware perspective on the phones with the different manufacturers. 
All right, yeah, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, while I've got you, is one additional question uh, relative to USB and NFC tokens. Is what about USB and NFC tokens and that are currently being used now and in the future? Uh, yeah, so we were going to talk about that initially uh, uh, on this, but uh, we took it off. Uh, the uh, yeah, the presentation because this is basically going to go off and in kind of a different uh, a direction. But uh, these tokens, certainly as I was talking about before, you know, uh, with uh, devices like a laptop, you know, it has a USB port. But if you want to do a PIV card, uh, you have to add a you know a, a smart card reader to it. So your smart card reader plugs into the USB port, and then you have to have a smart card or whatever. With these types of tokens like UBT, uh, the ones provided by GND and and Talus and others, you, know, you can just plug those into, uh, you know, the USB port, and it acts like a PIV card or a smart card. You know. uh, but we just didn't want to delve into that too much, and that's probably something that we should probably talk about in a, a future webinar. But I put on that was left over from when we took off uh, these types of tokens uh, from a PowerPoint uh, in the reference section of my presentation. There's a, a reference to the NSC multi-factor authentication guidance, and it has a fairly good list of uh, USB and NFC tokens, along with other authenticators, just software authenticators like uh, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticators, those being applications. But if anybody's interested in, I would suggest looking at NFC or NSA guidance. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, as I'm going to bring Roger back in, uh, a couple questions relative to biometrics is, is I know you presented a number of different types of biometric applications. Is it what, what biometric modality do you believe is best? Well, I think that's actually kind of a loaded question. Um, I, what I've found is really no one works for everybody. Uh, face is showing more promise, yeah, you know, but I think it's really early. But there's you know, when we were at the Pentagon, we actually used combination of iris and fingerprint because certain people couldn't use fingerprint, certain people couldn't use iris, but the whole population we found could use one or the other. So having multimodal, I'm a big fan of multimodal and user choice. Uh, face is showing some real promise, and the thing that's really nice about face is it's, you know, it doesn't require specialized sensors, you know, looking at things like enrolling with the phone or matching on the phone. Uh, so that um, shows some real promise and the galleries are so big for training like AI that it allows us to get really good accuracy. Mm -hmm. Very good. Is what, what, uh, what do you think uh, is the biggest issue whenever a potential end user is trying to deploy biometrics. And sort of what I alluded to, it's it's that the enrollment that you can't um, get a good picture, and that's hard to test. Like when NIST does the testing, they already have a gallery. Um, it's that collecting the images is one of the things that you know. Hey, what do you do for um, a person whose irises are too dark or their fingerprints are so shallow it's hard to get the good reading on the sensor uh, so it's and that's you know requires live testing so a lot of it is actually anecdotal because there hasn't been these statistically significant tests of like hey how many people can come up there you know you you can go and say yeah well disney used fingerprint for a while they actually used a two-finger geometry for a while um, had large populations, but they can't tell you how many people di it didn't work for. You know, they developed get around sort of things. And I think in their case, they actually had your picture too. So they just look at your picture and decide, hey, we'll let them in. And that was not uh, automated. That was just a person looking at the uh, reference picture and the person presenting themselves at the gate. Sure, sure. 
All right, very good. Uh, I think we've got time probably for one more question. Is that Lars? I'm going to bring you back in. Uh, I, I know you gave an example relative to mobile device apps uh, being used in access control. Is in the example you gave in the presentation, um, does an application like that actually exist? Uh, the, uh, this finished solution that I talked about here, that is just something that is a, a what if for future. However, all the subsystems that work integrated through the back end and some, at some level to the front end and the phone, they do exist. It is just a matter of, of com combining them and make a final solution. And uh, that, is, that requires you know, some, some fairly big back end like this that requires some, some fairly significant processing power. And that's what we're seeing being available today, both as I said, on the back end system as well as at the front. So I think this is an example of uh, an exciting application that we may see in the future here, probably fairly close, I hope. Okay. I'd like to uh, tie one, one, more, one more thing here. I didn't want to interrupt the great answer that we got from Roger, but on the, the uh, automated uh, presentation attacks, uh, there is a document that's called SP-263B that deals with, with authentication. And it states that uh, if you have too many failed authentication attempts on a biometric, then after X number of attempts, the system must sit still for a, for a minute. And that, that time increases exponentially thereafter, after each failed attempt. And that is there. The intent of that is, of course, to slow down an attacker that is trying to spoof a system with either an automated or multiple fingerprint or biometric authentication attempts. I just wanted to get that in there too. So that's SP 263-B. Yeah, no, very good. Thank you for that. So, and with that is, I believe we're at the top of the hour now. Uh, just a quick, couple of quick points is uh, the deck that you uh, have seen here over the last hour will be posted uh, on the Secure Technology Alliance website. So look th for that here in the coming days. Uh, and then I just also wanted to put a plug out there, as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, and we talked about, it, I think, a couple times through the presentation. This is just part one in a multi-part series uh, around the future of access control. Uh, so please look uh, for dates relative to uh, part two, which will be coming here in the next couple of weeks. So thank you again to our panelists. Thanks again to all those that contributed relative to the content. And then also thanks to those of you who uh, took time out of, your, out of your day to attend today. So thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you.